we tend to think of learning technology and of the MOOC in particular as though it were a single static thing. But in fact, the MOOC is part of an ecosystem. Learning is part of an ecosystem. I'm Stephen Downs, and today I'm going to take you through the powers of, well, not can, as in Ray Eames' 1997 film, or 1977 film, but powers of two to the whatever that work pretty well with MOOCs and with education in general. We're going to begin with 2000. 2000 is the size of the first MOOC. The MOOC that George Siemens and I created, it's the size of a small town. It's the size of a group of people getting together, too many to know everyone individually, but enough that we can create something like a network and create something where interactivity and participation created more than just a course, but rather an event, something to be remembered. That first MOOC was the first of a series of MOOCs, and we did a number of MOOCs and over the years attracted more than 20,000 people together. We did MOOCs on personal learning, we did MOOCs on knowledge, we did MOOCs on change in education, and as well, the original MOOC was followed by Jim Groom's DS106, by Inga DeWard's mobile learning MOOC, and by other MOOCs that were created again, pretty much in the same connectivist model, creating a network the way George and I began. We jump up another power of 10 to 200,000. And that's more or less the number that was attracted to the first X MOOC, the Artificial Intelligence MOOC created by Mor Norvig and Thrun at Stanford University, which was based more on a traditional approach to learning, but also on a topic that was very popular and the idea clearly captured the public imagination. People flocked to this MOOC, people flocked to other MOOCs following. And indeed, in the years that followed, millions of people, two million say, went to these early MOOCs, the MOOCs that were offered by companies like Coursera, Udemy, Udacity, and even if we include some outliers like iTunes U, which is you know an Apple proprietary technology for MOOCs, P2P U, edX that was created by MIT, which also created OpenCourseWare, the Open Universities, Future Learn. All of these institutions, all of these MOOCs captured the imagination. They ended up with time declaring them, declaring 2012 the year of the MOOC. And from my perspective, it really looked like at the time, and I still think so today, the concept of open online education had taken off. 20 million the size of a small nation, or maybe the quarter of the size of a larger nation. The idea of the national MOOC strategy, we began after this initial flurry of activity in companies to see nations as a whole, organizations as a whole, things like the Commonwealth of Learning, the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, and others creating a national MOOC strategy to bring open online education to people. It is again a concept that captured people's imagination. 200 million. The overall impact of MOOCs, the overall impact of what open online learning can do for an entire culture. I've been privileged over the years to work a lot with my colleagues in the Spanish-speaking world, in the Portuguese-speaking world of Latin America. And we see a connection between the creation of open online learning, the approach where people are able to take control of their own learning and manage their learning, learning for themselves, and the history in these cultures of the idea of education as personal empowerment, education indeed even as a form of liberation. We think back to the writing of people like Paulo Freire uh, or even Ivan Illich, and we see the MOOC as creating the online version of this new kind of pedagogy of liberation. Two billion, 
the MOOC world, the online world, the picture where we see that the MOOC is more than just this thing that is a course that is online. What you see represented there is all of the different disciplines that have a representation in academic journals and there are different colors and different clusters for different topics. Here there is nursing, there there is technology, etc. And the lines you see in between connecting these dots are actual citations from one journal to another journal. And we see that there aren't separate domains of knowledge. There isn't a hierarchy of knowledge. There isn't a foundation. Rather, knowledge itself in the MOOC world, in the world of 2 billion people online, looks like a network. Knowledge itself is the same structure as the MOOC, only accessed by 2 billion people rather than the 2,000 people that we started with in CCK08. We'll stop for a second and linger at the population of 200 million and think about what that translates to in terms of learning. We have this world of knowledge. Now we can also have this world of learning, this open resource network that is available to everybody on the internet. I'm thinking of things like the directory of open access journals. I'm thinking of things like, well, this network that we see here, uh, this a uh, network that includes the Gulf of Mexico, cold seeps, seamount ecology, coral genetics, DNA barcoding. A person can immerse themselves in this world of learning and move from one topic to the next to the next as their own interests draw them. Now we're moving back down. We're moving back down from the global back to the national. And now, instead of simply a national MOOC strategy, we're thinking of the MOOC as open online learning. And open online learning at the national level means things like national repositories, national initiatives to make open educational resources and other learning resources available to people on a national scale to be used to support their own learning however they wish bringing it down another power of 10. We have maybe at the city-wide level, the two million wide level, individual collections and individual systems, a collection of specific learning activities, say. The use of learning record stores to hold activity reports that a community or a group of people have undertaken. Summaries and results, learning data, learning analytics, drawing on millions of records from millions of users in order to create an interactive, reactive, and sometimes predictive system. Moving down even further, now we get into the area of personal learning analytics. The idea of the quantified self producing hundreds of thousands of data points and using these data points to provide interventions, if you will, uh, provide resources to, ad to adapt educational technology, to provide the learner with a dashboard of what their activities are, what their results are, what do they know, how do they know they know, and what can they learn or what can they draw from from the rest of the community in order to improve their performance. Let's bring it down another level, 20,000 the size maybe of a community of practice, perhaps people working in OERs, perhaps people working in physics or geography or beekeeping or whatever. The community of practice is the place where people working with a discipline get together, exchange comments, exchange resources, share stories, think about what works, what doesn't work, build on their own base of knowledge and contribute to the community base of knowledge. Let's bring it back down even further. 2,000 people, the size of a town, the synchronous live on-air event, the MOOC webinar, the sort of talks that we gave yesterday and the day before and the day before, the event that can have an audience 
but is also small enough and personal enough that a small group of people, well, 2,000 people is small in this world, can get something from it. Moving down further, 200, more or less Dunbar's number. The actual number that's cited very often is 150. 200 is the number that distinguishes between a group of people where everybody knows everybody else, where you can have a common identity, a shared purpose and all of that, and a network of people where people don't necessarily know each other, where people are working on their own agenda, where the focus has to be on interaction and communication, negotiation, cooperation rather than collaboration of purpose. The MOOC, people ask me sometimes, what size should a MOOC be? I give them Dunbar's number and I say, it needs to be more than just a group of people. It needs to be a network of people. Let's bring it on down. 20, linked data, your world, your world of work, your world of the home life, data the size of your car perhaps, or the size of your car and a few other cars around you. Linked data, the creation of your own personal network, your own personal world, the people you know, the things you read, whatever you talk about, the personal graph, bringing it down further. You and a friend, your personal learning network, your direct one-to-one -one relations you have with other people, the connection that you have with an online resource, Facebook, Twitter, Ning, the writing that you do, the art that you create with them, the library that you may have of the things that they've written, the things that they've created, the basis of a connectivist view of the world to you and something, connecting, something and something else, connecting, 0 0.2, the size of a hand, something less than a connection, something less than a course or a world. The interface, the way you interact with this world, the thing that's right in front of you, the pattern of the moment, the way you measure distances, the way you pick out data from the environment, see what's important, plot a route on a map. A bit further down now, language, text, pictures on the internet, speaking in lolcat, speaking in forms of images and graphics, shared jokes, shared assumptions, thinking of objects, actions, events, any, anything you can get your hands on as part of a language, part of an interaction, part of a communication. Thinking of these things that you send back and forth as being the mechanism for or the means by which you interact with each other, where the key is the interaction with the other and not necessarily some kind of meaning or content in the signal of your interaction. Pulling it back further, 0 0.002. Touch, interactivity, hands-on. This is a picture of the NeuroTouch simulator that we have here at NRC connected to our LPSS system. The point here isn't the symbolic, isn't the visual, isn't the textual. It's actually putting our hands on authentic devices and doing the very same physical actions with the very same resistance and weight that an actual neurosurgeon would experience during the performance of an actual operation. Touch, the beginning of interaction. Take it down further, 0 0.0002, the neural network, the brain. Again, an interactive network of individual entities. It looks like the structure of the MOOC. It looks like the structure of the knowledge universe. That's not coincidental. The same pattern repeated at the global 200 million level, at the local two, 2000 level, now at the personal 0002 level. The neural network is your own personal knowledge. 
your knowledge is literally the connection of one neuron to the next neuron. Your learning is literally the creation of these connections, the strengthening of these connections, or the weakening of these connections. Neural plasticity, the ability to shape and reshape our neural network is what enables learning, is indeed what learning is. Bringing it back down. Zero, 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 two. The individual synapse, the point where one neuron connects with another one. The neural version of the one-to-one -one connection. The mechanisms through which chemical and electrical interactions cause a signal to be sent from one neuron to another neuron, jumping over that synapse, that gap, that potential, and creating a, a reaction, a new action on the part of the new neuron. Bringing it down further, the bit, the ultimate, the change that happens in one neuron after an interaction with another neuron. Everything can be brought down to, can this be on or this be off? Is this activated or is this inactivated? The combination of billions and billions of these individual neural decisions, neural decisions that are completely independent of the content of the communication, completely independent of the context and of course the world of 200 billion people, uh, the bit, the ultimate place where learning happens, where the signal either creates a response or does not create a response. So those are the levels. We go all the way out to 200 million. We come all the way back to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, What do we say about that? Well, when we zoom out, we're not just shifting levels. We're not just moving from one level to the next to the next. Each time we zoom out, indeed, each time we zoom in, we're increasing the area of complexity. If we just think of learning at a 2,000 level, 2,000 people in a course, or the online interaction that we have, that's one thing. But now when we start thinking about the next level and the next level and the next level, we're increasing dramatically the complexity of the ecosystem, the complexity of the environment in which we're working. Because we're looking at things interacting not just on the one level, but on the multiple levels. These levels are really one network connecting with another network, connecting with another network. And they're separate networks. They're not all the same networks. But on the other hand, they're all the same networks in the sense that the nodes of one network might be individual networks. And in that individual network, there are nodes. And in, in that network, the node of that network is yet another network. This is how we get increased complexity moving up, increased complexity moving down. Complexity isn't simply the result of number. Complexity is the result of interdependence and interactivity so that the actions in one network influence the actions in another network. There's nothing mystical here. It's all causal. It's all physical phenomena. But because we're dealing with so many things at so many levels, it actually feels and sometimes looks like chaos. This leads us to what we'll call Downs' two dogmas of educationism is drawn, of course, from Quine's two dogmas of empiricism. And the two dogmas are these. Reductionism is false. When you go from one level to another level, you're not going from one thing that is composed of other things. We can't get down to the basic foundations of, of learning. At every step, it's a network. At every step, it's complex, interactive. And consequently, as well, there isn't what we might call this analytic synthetic distinction. One level does not represent another level. Uh, the activities in 
one level are not composed of competencies, say, that are expressed at another level. Each level is, in a sense, independent. Each level functions on its own, and the relationship between one and the other is the relationship between these different networks. But if it's not a relationship of composition, and if it's not a relationship of representation, then what is the relationship of one of these networks with another, one level to another? The answer is the basis of cognition. If you're moving from a lower level to a higher level, this is the phenomenon of emergence. The idea here is that a pattern in the lower level is perceived as an entity in the higher level. Emergence, for example, is when you look at a video screen and see a picture of Richard Nixon. Really, it's just a bunch of dots, but at the higher level, it's Richard Nixon, a single node. The same relation works the other way, and the inverse of emergence is recognition. When you are at the higher level, if you are a person and you are looking at a bunch of dots, the process is one of recognition. You look at the dots and you recognize Richard Nixon. How does that happen? It is not that there is a representation of Richard Nixon or anything like that. Rather, the phenomena that are presented to you at one level result in the activation of a particular set of connections at the other level. This partial this recognition of phenomena through partial presentation of perceptual data allows us to categorize it allows us to think of kinds of things on the basis of recognition if you think about it you look at something in the world you see a patch of orange you think ah tiger that ah tiger is spreading activation in your you know in your neural net that's you recognizing a phenomenon in the world. Of course, I said levels, levels, one level, another level, another level, but of course, the world is not composed of levels. That's just an order we've put on it. The world is far more complex than that. The world is levels, the world is clusters, the world is crazy interacting networks that are sort of big, sort of small. You can think of the world, if you look at this network here, the public transport infrastructure, the city transport infrastructure, a driving sharing service, your own car and everything related to your own car, the street map, the city map, breaking down into cities, breaking down into townships, breaking down into health districts, whatever. It's all the levels are mashed, interactive, and not organized in neat boundaries the way we like to. So, and all of these networks interact with each other through this process of emergence and recognition, the emergence of characteristic phenomena, the recognition of these phenomena by our perceptual system. That's the ecosystem that we're thinking about and that we're talking about in MOOCs. That is why in MOOCs, learning isn't simply taking some sort of representational content and transferring it to other people. That is why in MOOCs, you don't begin with a foundational idea and then work through a series of steps to reach some kind of facts or knowledge. It's because the world isn't structured that way. The world doesn't work that way. And if we want our educational system to be successful, then we want to think about the world as it is and work with the world as it is and not the way we think that it must be, should be, or ought to be. I'm Stephen Downs. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. It was part of the personal learning MOOC. This is March the 10th, 2016, and I thank you.